Servite Order began around the year 1233, and it began with seven cloth merchants, seven businessmen, who saw a need and responded to that need. And the need was this, there was a civil war going on in Florence, Italy, between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And so they chose not to take sides, but what they chose to do was minister to the needs of the wounded. We were working together in a hospital called the Fonte Viva. They were good friends among themselves. So as cloth merchants, they had storerooms full of material. They took their material, went out, and started to provide bandages and care for the wounded. And they were indiscriminate. They just went out and did what they, what they saw and what they needed. And they got the reputation of being Hospitallers of Mary, is the title. These men call themselves servants. And it's uh, interesting that in Italy, the streets, most of the time, the streets that lead up to one of our houses are called the Via dei Servi, the street of the servants. Then when the Ghibellines were against their own party, which were the, the Guelphs, uh, took over the Gorbi to Florence, they were advised to, to leave Florence because it was dangerous. And the bishop himself, Bishop Ardingo, uh, gave them a little property, Monte Scenario, about 18 miles from here. A mountainside, and they spent some time in prayer there, trying to figure out what their focus and their mission would be in the world. And it became a journey of faith, meditation, growth, and finding of their real vocation. This is the, the place or the beginning, beginning of servant, servant of Mary. The skulls, the skulls of our fathers. And they, and they started their life uh, very humble, very simple. They were working together, praying together. They had left their families and friends and became so close together that they decided that they could still continue to be a presence and visible in the world. And during that time in prayer there, they continued to find themselves drawn to the spirit, drawn to the ideals, drawn to the mission of the gospel. To ask for uh, wisdom, for light, uh, which they did. And after some time, he himself, their advisor, Peter of Verona, had a vision from Our Lady. And uh, she uh, said that definitely she wanted them to start a new order dedicated to her. Constantly providing service, providing compassion, providing a focus on Mary, the Mother of God. From that mountain, they came back into the city to build a church here. Bishop had already died, so they had to ask for permission from the Bishop of Siena, who was acting uh, as the Bishop of Florence as well. And they started a little church here. And that became the central beginning place of ministry for the seven founders. And from there, the order spread throughout Italy. This church is one of the really ancient Christian sites of Rome, where Christians used to meet, probably at the house of somebody called Marcellus. And in 13, the 1360s, I think it was, the Pope of the time gave it to the Servite friars. So that was way back in the 14th century, the 1300s, the Servite friars have been here ever since. And nowadays, it is mainly one of the city center churches of Rome, not a parish church, 
but it's also the headquarters of the Servite Order throughout the world. St. Peregrine was a Servite, and um, he lived more than 700 years ago in Forli, Italy, which makes him sound like, you know, sort of long ago and far away. But actually, he's um, a very relevant saint to our times. I think that's one of the remarkable things about, about our order and about, um, about our saints and our church, is that things, certain things never quite um, become irrelevant. And um, two things are interesting about St. Peregrine is that the times that he lived in were not unlike our own. A uh, great time of transition in society. A lot of people were moving in from the countryside into the city. And there were lots of urban problems. Uh, problems with homelessness, a uh, huge gap between the rich and the poor, um, violence. And um, Peregrine was actually um, a member of a street gang actually a leader of a street gang. We, do, we think of those as a sort of a contemporary problem. And so he was one of these kids who was just kind of lost, you know. Uh, he was angry at the church and angry at society and angry at pretty much everybody else. And one day in Fort Lee, there was another Servite priest named St. Philip Benizzi who was coming and preaching reconciliation. And Peregrine certainly didn't want to hear anything about peace and healing. So he literally drove uh, Philip out of town, physically attacked him. And Philip turned around and said, you know, you really don't know what you're doing. I forgive you. Well, now this was very confusing to Peregrine because he'd grown up, you know, everybody was theoretically Catholic. But here was somebody who was actually putting the works of Jesus into practice, taking the risk to actually say and do something that Jesus might have done. And so that made Peregrine really think about his life. And he spent about a dozen years searching. And eventually he made that decision to enter the religious order that Philip was part of and, and became a Servite. And he spent really the rest of his life serving the people that he had sort of laughed at when he was a kid. Uh, the poor and the sick and the needy. And when he was about 60 years old, he developed cancer. And the surgeons said that his leg would have to be amputated. Now, you know, in the 21st century, that may not be a huge operation, but you can imagine what that was like in the 13th century when uh, the physician and the barber were usually the same person. So somebody, whatever this surgery, was probably going to be fatal. But he dragged himself before an image of Christ on the cross, and during the night, he just had this experience of Jesus reaching down to him, and the next morning, his cancer was healed. And so he became the um, patron saint of people living with cancer. And uh, uh, so part of the devotion, I think, to St. Peregrine is that he connects with our time in two very relevant ways. One is life-threatening illness, cancer, and the other is some um, young people who are trying to find their way, uh, people who are um, emotionally lost and, and feeling no hope. And so at our, at our monthly masses, we have a, uh, a mass each month and a holy hour, also um, a service in Spanish. And all of these are ways in which people are, are simply drawn to the, to the saint because they, uh, even if they don't feel even if they don't experience a miracle or physical healing, uh, they experience the companionship. Uh, here was someone who uh, knew what it was like to be told that your life is in jeopardy and to having to trust in God when really the doctors couldn't do anything more. And so a lot of people simply relate to his story. Now there were two friars who came over to the United States by way of London, uh, Father Austin Marini and Father Venturi. Austin Marini is known as kind of the founder of the friars here in the United States, of bringing the Servite presence into the United States here and settling here on the west side of Chicago. Marini was interested not in serving only the Italian foundation, he wanted an American province and so he petitioned quarters for some new territory, new land, and we wound up here uh, on the west side of the city, on the outskirts of the city, 
in what's known as, at that time as Prairie Land out here. Uh, the building itself, the Basilica Church building, started in 1892 and was finished in 1902. So it took about 12 years or so uh, to build uh, this magnificent building. Uh, and everything that's in it that's white or gray is marble, Carrara marble from uh, Italy. I will tell you that this church is Chicago's first basilica. Uh, Chicago has three basilicas. It is the oldest of all of the basilicas here in, in Chicago and it was designated a basilica because it's been a place of pilgrimage for folks. This basilica was created as a reminder of the faith tradition but of our Italian history and our heritage and yet the city grew up and around us was the Irish community here on the west side. In 1948, the Friars were asked to take on uh, the missions of Zululand, South Africa. And so there were a group of young men who gathered their things, put them in the trunks, and found their way over to South Africa. I've been in South Africa since 1964. At present, I am parish priest of the Serite Parish at Mutubutuba, which is um, a quasi-urban parish with uh, 19 rural con congregations. Uh, when we first came to, to Zululand, the concentration was on Catholic schools. So in our small diocese, which is really a vicariat apostolic, at one time we had 14 primary or grade schools and one high school. <laughs> Start the sea high school. It was founded by the three uh, Sevat friars. They came from Chicago, but via Swaziland. Then the school grew, and of course all outstation they also now had now there, mission schools. But for quite a long time, what actually happened, the school could not afford now to pay salaries of the teachers. Unlike Ireland and Australia, the government did not, um, uh, what's the word, subsidize uh, teachers' salaries, we could no longer afford them. So, but now, now the, the property still belongs to the church. Yeah. But we usually still get now donation from abroad, specifically from what they, they, they serve at the friars. Yeah. And we appreciate now everything which they've done. So then we knew we had to do something different and we concentrated on um, training people for uh, lay ministries. We first started off with uh, putting parish councils in place and then we got into ministry training and today they're a wonderful help to us. Um, other aspects of our work opened up too. We got involved in community development projects like gardens and handcrafts and um, gardening clubs, some farming, some tree planting. And most recently our main emphasis has been on the AIDS apostolate. It was the surveys that brought us out here in 1966 and, that, and helped us to start off the work. We were, we were living on the mission and they helped us to, with, with vehicles and so on in the early years. And you can see this is a Servite church that we, we're using here. You'll still find people around the place saying, oh, my, my child is alive because of milk from the Romans, you know. <laughs> they, they don't understand about Servites, but they do know that it was the Catholic Church that supplied the milk that, that brought this, back, this child back from sort of being severely malnourished to being a healthy individual. As caring for the poor, being people who live in community, being people who are committed to fraternity, and this is what we try to do here. We live in community. There are many other missionary orders and missionary congregations where you have one man in one place. We don't do that. We always have two or three because it's very difficult to talk to the 
local people to the Christians about building community if you yourself don't live in community. And that helps us when you go to the community we serve. If you know to serve each other in the community uh, house where you stay, it's easy to serve also the people. Like, if you stay alone, you, you end up wanting to be served than to serve. So for me, this community life comes first, to, to, to serve than to be served. Since 1948, we've had responsibility for the territory of South Africa in Zululand, uh, KwaZulu-Natal area, and it's continued to grow and establish itself as a full-fledged church. Uh, we're almost at full diocesan stage, but it's been a wonderful blessing and a great gift to watch the church in this area of South Africa emerge. The Servite already came to Australia in 1951 at the invitation of the, at that time, Archbishop of Perth. That began with a parish uh, out in the uh, outside of the city and then a parish nearby here. Uh, and then in 1958, uh, the school began. We have a very diverse cultural group here from Europe, Southeast Asia, Africa. So it's a very multicultural school. To me, the most uh, obvious characteristic of our students is um, their sense of community and belonging in our school. And making sure that uh, everybody within that community feels uh, a part of it and feels that they have a say and, and all of those sorts of things. That's the reason why Certainly I've stayed here as long as I have and um, we have a motto here that once a Servite, always a Servite. We're not just from one little place, we're a part of something greater. It's a whole bigger purpose and coming to Servite, you're actually being prepared to serve for that purpose. Certainly we've been very fortunate here in Western Australia at Servite College to have the uh, Servite priest very much involved. Uh, Father Chris Ross as president oversees the work that we do, the way we administer the college, our policies and practices to make sure that we stay within the Servite charism. Certainly taking the charisms from the Servite order, the charisms of service and Mary uh, are essential to our school. I mean the Marian aspect is one of service anyway, you know, and, uh, and one of listening to the Lord and uh, doing what he tells you as Mary did, you know, so that Mary I see Mary more as a, as a model Christian to follow. In Perth, our college is run by a council that's appointed by the Servite Friars, and they manage the overall financial direction, uh, strategic plan for the school community, and again in that role of maintaining the, the Servite presence within the school. We've got a small presence, but an impact into the culture of Australia, and that was a really expans expansive opportunity for us to enter into another continent, to see the larger dimension of the church and of the world, and to have an influence there as the order continues to grow and move. In 1958, Cardinal Manning invited the Servites to establish a school in Anaheim, California, a uh, school for boys, and we were proud to be able to do that. A number of the friars left Chicago and other parts of the world to come into Anaheim to establish the school uh, of Servite High School. It's a wonderful place with 900 boys and an opportunity for them to continue to grow, explore their faith, and test their mental capacities as well as their physical capabilities. When you belong to the Servite family and you work with this community, you you are part of a tradition that dates back to 1233 that has many saints, many you know, blessed people and, and many martyrs and, that have done some really great things for not just Christianity but for Catholicism. And so you're, you belong to something bigger than yourself. We're very proud of our school. We're proud of the tradition that Servite has carried on in the lives of its alumni but more importantly in the lives of the family of Servite and faculty, staff, and student body. In the tradition of the Order, the Blessed Mother has always been the central figure. And the Seven Holy Founders and all the Servites, the friars that followed, some became saints, some, you know, did not. Um, they all had a very, very special love for our Blessed Mother. Mary is, all, uh, is a number one in our, in, in our life because she's inspiring us. Of course, Jesus 
is on top. We can't, uh, we can't deny that. But Mary is the one who inspires us with her prayer and with her example. For Servites, Mary is his first disciple, even before Peter. As you, from the wedding feast at Cana, she tells the waiters, do whatever he tells you. So she points the direction towards him. And so when you get to the foot of the cross, you realize that not only is it John, his beloved friend, but it's also his mother, and, and they share that discipleship. And people feel an affinity with us. They feel a closeness with us. Many times when we go into parishes, they say, you know, you serve us, there's something different about you. You don't run out the door after Mass. You stay in the back of church and you talk with us. We know where we can find you. We know where we can come to you and talk to you and, and celebrate life with you. And so I, that's a great uh, hallmark of hospitality. So basically you have this orientation of helping people and of course um, working for the church, spreading the gospel. And uh, in a situation like ours here, you're much more closer to the actual gospel ideal of going out, meeting people, spreading the gospel, seeing people accepted, converting and so on, than you would see in a back home situation. The opportunities to do uh, and go and see different things, um, the opportunity to be involved in different kinds of ministries, um, these are some of the things that, um, that touch me about being a servite. That's what a servite means to me to be living in community, to be fraternal, not only in, among our own people, but with the community at large, and to care for the poor and the needy and those who are in want. That's one of the main things that we try to do as friars, to be with the poorest, uh, to help developing people, and to tackle social problems throughout the world. And to serve the people, that's what comes first. Like if now you study about the origins of the order, you'll find out that seven men, their aim was to stay together, pray together, uh, and they were called afterwards to be priests. For, for, for us, what comes first is brotherhood, staying together, praying together, uh, just living in community. And so the Servite Orders had really these two positions, one of meditation, prayer, reflection that's up on the mountain away from the people, but a very, very strong sense of calling in being part of the service to others. But I think what's probably the strongest feature of what the Servites did was that they didn't stay up on the mountain. So they weren't the gurus that stayed on, up on the top and just prayed and reflected. They came back down from the mountain when they felt their hearts were full of that drive uh, that new calling to, to serve, and that's where they went around the world. So out of Florence, into the rest of Europe, into Northern Europe, uh, to the States, to Southeast Asia, to uh, United Kingdom, to Australia, was part of their journey to be within communities and living as part of the, the growth of communities. But there's always that Monte scenario that's sitting there where you go back from your daily work, back to prayer, back to our link with Mary, that gives them the strength to get up in the morning the next day and go back out and start working with people. So this duality of, of their purpose and their presence and their history is, uh, I think, a very important part. This is a, a partnership that we're talking about here. We're talking about a partnership in ministry. So we're ta we Servites talk of it as family. The work of the church belongs to all of us. We each have different roles and different tasks within that partnership. And what we do is support one another in the mission. And the mission is to bring alive a compassionate presence into this world that can be sometimes harsh, to be of service for others, and to share that discipleship that points to Christ. There are 600 secular servites around the United States that have connected and adopted and owned our mission. And in doing so, they live their lives like our first founders. They live their lives like the Austin Marines and, and others who have ventured out and created the mission and helped define the mission. That's a partnership that we don't take lightly. For anyone who's considering, what does it mean to be a Servite, or how can I be involved with us, or how can I continue to, to, to experience some of the things that you have, you know Servites locally but we invite you into a relationship that will help you to know the Servites 
from a worldwide perspective and enter into a deeper, richer experience of knowing us globally. So my invitation to you is come and see. My invitation to you is come check us out. My invitation to you is come partner with us and let's do the mission together.